by that. I do not believe that a child is responsible for that. But as an adult, I believe that I am responsible for my reaction to that. And is that clear? Because a lot of times we come in here and well-meaning sponsors end up putting more shame on us than we already have. She says, say it again. A I am not responsible for the child abuse that happened to me as a child. Now, I may have those people on my resentment list. If it's sexual abuse, a lot of people think that it ought to be on the sex inventory. In my opinion, it does not belong there. It belongs on the resentment inventory because I didn't harm anyone sexually as a child. I was a victim. But if I harm someone as an adult as a result of that abuse, for that I am responsible. Now, the other thing is, is that a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous are made to feel ashamed and responsible that as a child they had something to do with that. No, you did not in my opinion, now this is what I believe, have anything to do with that. But what I am responsible for is my reaction to that as an adult. And that's what we're going to inventory, and that's what we're going to take responsibility for. And by taking responsibility for my reactions to what happened to me, I can heal. But it's, being, it's a big leap in faith because it's a big willingness to go take a look. But we can heal. Is that clear? That's a real that's a real hard issue. But I just feel like that so many women are made to feel shame by well meaning people in Alcoholics Anonymous to make them feel like what happened to them as a child is their fault. It is not your fault. We were victims. Okay. So what specific what goes into sexual assault? Things that I've sexual that I've done. It's that in a sex inventory it's people I have harmed sexually. That's what the book says. It's about the people I have harmed. Now, a lot of that may be as a result of my anger and all of that from sexual abuse, but those are people I have harmed. I don't know about any of you, but I have used a lot of men to get things I wanted. And I gave them sex, it was no big deal, I didn't think. But a lot of things I got that way I paid a hundred times for, spiritually and emotionally. Okay, is that, is that, did I make myself clear? <clears throat> the book says, I have harmed people I have harmed. Let me see exactly what Joe and Charlie say here on the inventory. Okay, the first column is, who did I harm? And the sex column. It didn't say, who harmed me? It says, who did I harm? Who harmed me goes in the resentment list. I'm, I'm angry with that. Okay, that's the resentment list. Column two is, what did I do? And then all of the instincts are the same. That always remains the same. Joe and Charlie are two guys that do big book seminars. And uh, they're, they are, uh, I know Terry would know their last names, but uh, they're two guys and they go around and they do big book seminars. And most every taper has tapes. Here comes Terry with a box of tape <laughs> to show you what they look like. They are excellent, absolutely excellent. And they talk about the big book comes alive. This is a 1992 big book study, Joe and Charlie. This was done in North Vancouver, BC. And if any of you, I put these tapes in my car. 
I drive around and listen to them because I don't know about you, but I, my memory doesn't hold all the time. So what I do is repetition strengthens and confirms and faith then comes naturally. That's what the book says. I have to hear it over and over and over. And it just makes the big book come alive for me. I have a better understanding of the big book. So I just highly encourage you, if you've never you know, done anything with these tapes, to do it. It has made it so clear to me. And uh, I just, inventories, it's like now, today, inventories, amends, we're going to talk about that, are clear. But you may, you know, forget what I say this weekend. And this goes through the whole part of the big book. Bill's story, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Silkworth, his letter, yeah. So, yes, Terry, five minutes. Okay, now when all of this is written down and we do this inventory, the first thing we do is do just like the book says, the step says, admit it to God, to myself, and to another person. Now, what is the first one? Admitted to God. And here's the, here's the rub I hear a lot of times, and I said the same thing. God already knows. That's not what it says, God already knows. It says admitted to God. So it was necessary for me. You do that, you interpret that however you want to interpret it. For me, I was told it was just as necessary that I give this inventory to God as it was that I give it to another person, which means read it. It's okay. Don't judge yourself. It's all right. Okay. It's okay. Just don't change what you've written, okay? Everybody hear that? Leave what you've written no matter what. If you stand there and say, oh, my God, I should have done this, I should have done that, because I think along with the disease of alcoholism comes the disease of perfectionism. <laughs> Leave it alone. And then admit it to yourself. Yes, these are my wrongs. This is what I did. And then take it to your sponsor. R. And another thing I want to be very clear on. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says choose carefully who you give your inventory to. Now, folks, remember that rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous are made up of very sick people. So be choose carefully when you take the inventory. And what I want to do is I want to stop now, and we're going to pick up here at 2 o'clock. I believe it's 2 o'clock. We'll pick up right here. So if you want to do this, 1 o'clock or whenever. Okay, if you want these to write down in your inventory, come take a look at them. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. Thanks, women. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Who needs a nap besides me? <laughs> Oh, we'll do this hour, and then we get to take a nap. I'm going to ask you this evening on the last um, on the last session that we're going to do that I'm going to ask you to give me 15 more minutes after the session because I want us to do some writing, and you can't put that on tape <laughs> because we're going to be just writing. So if you would allow me that, I would appreciate it. Uh, okay, let's get back to this heavy-duty stuff we were doing on step four. You'll have um, you'll have the copy now, so you'll know how to uh, how the categories break down. <clears throat> okay, we're going to do our three inventories: the resentment inventory, the fear inventory, and the sex inventory. And when you get to their resentment, I am angry at or I'm resentful at the cause and what it affects. And then the fears is what am I afraid of? Why am I afraid? What, you know, what, uh, what it affects? 
And what's my part in it? Or what is the character defect? <coughs> the sex inventory is who have I harmed because of my, rea my sexual behavior. And again, I wanted to make that very clear because of the people who have had sexual abuse as a child. That is not the same. That goes on the resentment inventory. And I think we need to be very mm -hmm. honest because I think a lot of times, if you're anything like me, being a woman, I would put myself in a victim role and not take responsibility for the stuff that I've done. And one of the things that I've learned is if I want to get well in this program, I've got to be rigorously honest, which means I have got to accept responsibility for my actions past and present. And that's the same as my feelings. I've got to accept them past and present. I can, they may very well have been justified, but I have to accept that they're my feelings. Okay, and after we do this, we're going to move on to step five, admitted to God, to myself, and to another human being. And we left off at the last session. I was getting ready to tell you about the part in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that talks about who we give the inventory to. Now, I always tell the women that I work with that, you know, I am more, I am very happy to listen to your inventory. And I think a lot of times it's really good if you can have that kind of relationship. But there are a lot of people in this program who have been betrayed, who have had a lot of violation. And the book is very clear, and it says, select this person carefully. And you may want to give it to, you know, someone who is like your spiritual advisor, like a minister or a priest. Please know that that's okay to do that. The book says it's okay to do that. And I have to, you know, I always want to, you know, tell people that the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, just because they've been here and they've been sober a long time, are not always, you know, totally honest. And that sometimes if you're not really sure, if you hear somebody gossiping about somebody else and, and you know you have any indication that that might be in a four-step, run like hell from that person if you have any consideration of giving a fifth step. Because it's very important that you do not, that you feel safe and that you do not have any feelings of betrayal because it's so important that we be rigorously honest. I mean, our lives are at stake here. With, this is not about making an AA sponsor happy. This is about saving my life. So, and the book is real clear about that. So it's like I always say, when all else fails, go to the book. Don't take my word for it. Go to the book. And after having done that, now you've got your ledger sheet here. Now we go to step six, being entirely ready to have these defects of character removed. And the book says, if we're not entirely ready to have all these character defects removed, now where are the character defects on our little paper here? Anybody know? The fourth column. That's our character defects. So why would you want to burn your inventory? This, is, this has all the information here. So if we burn the inventory, we get rid of, you know, then we don't have the information. <clears throat> so we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And it says, the book says, if we're not ready, to just continue to pray for the willingness to get ready. That doesn't mean that you can't take the step because what we're going to do is we're, gonna, we're probably ready to have most of them removed, but maybe there's a few we're not ready to have removed. And then step seven says humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. That's it. Now, there's a guy in our AA group at home. <clears throat> His name is Frank H. He's a great guy. He's just, if, if he won't let us let, make him a guru because in case anybody didn't know, gurus are self-appointed. And he won't let us make him a guru, but he's been around for a while, and he's always saying, if you don't like, you know, the way I'm acting, I've asked God to remove it. He just hasn't. 
Because <laughs> that's what the step says. Ask God, just humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. And then the book says we have completed step seven. Now, if you think you have any power, I was told, Polly, if you think you have any power to remove your shortcomings, think again. Only God can remove our shortcomings. What, I, what has been my experience is I get this whole series of opportunities to get rid of my shortcomings. That has been my experience. But I do not have the power in which to remove my shortcomings. Only God has. So, you know, you can take a deep breath and know that if you've asked him, that probably what you're going to get is a series of opportunities to grow. Step eight. Made a list of all the persons I had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Now, where's the list? The first column of the inventory. So it's all laid out in your inventory. It's a ledger sheet. It's an inventory. And then step nine is made direct amends whenever possible. Finish the step for me. Made direct amends. Would hurt my... Right. Thank you. Just drew a blank. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about step nine. I think that in order to, for me to be set free, I need to be willing to make direct amends. And it has also been my experience that when I see somebody that is stuck, that I believe that there's two places that where is the cause of being stuck. And, and do you know what I'm referring to when I say stuck? Okay, just, just can't seem to move forward, can't seem to get any better. Just, you know, just like, oh my God, what am I doing? I feel like I'm doing everything right. That it's two places. It's either fourth step or ninth step. That those are the places where we become stuck. But it's those two places of which the ego is at risk are those two spots. And I know for me that if I'm not willing to make direct amends, that I can be stuck. Now, a lot of times we say, well, such and such did more to me than I did to them. And I was reading in the book today, and I'd just like to... Can I take my book back upstairs? I have. Um, I can't remember exactly what page it's on, but let's see if I can while we're talking. And it's talking about that sometimes it was talking about making amends for just how I felt about that person. You know, that is important too because a lot of times how we feel about somebody can certainly keep us from having a very good relationship with that person. Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and express expressing our regret. It, does anybody have any trouble understanding that? <laughs> because, <laughs> see, this was my, and I'm, you know, I probably had more arguments than anyone because I'm a very prideful person. I certainly didn't like to admit that, but I find out that that's me. And I would say to, um, I would say to my AA sponsor, but I didn't hurt them. And she would say, did you have ill feelings toward them? Well, of course I had ill feelings. Then you make amends for that. Because what happens is, is that we get, you know, we have these invisible walls that are in front of us. 
And if I want to have freedom, and if I want to be happy, joyous, and free, then I've got to start tearing down these walls brick by brick. And a lot of times it's really very difficult for me to go up to a person and say, you know, I'm really sorry about how I felt about you. And I also, I have done a lot of harm to people by talking behind their back. I'm very bad about that. And it seems like I can just get into a really good character defect and, and I can really start talking about people. And it's gossipy, and I, we can laugh, you know, a whole bunch of us get together and say, well, they never take their inventory, so somebody has to. And, you know, those kind of attitudes and just really start gossiping. And what happens is, is I begin to feel ickier and ickier and ickier. And I have found out that the person who suffers from that the most is me. So it's really necessary for me to make amends for how I felt about a person, just feelings. And the book tells me to do that. And what happens is, is I get to bring more bricks down one by one and become happy, joyous, and free. And the, the book is very clear to say that we don't tell them about their shortcomings you know, they may or may not ever get into recovery. They may or may not ever get a sponsor. They may or may not ever be sitting in a retreat like this saying, you know, I, I used to say things like, well, if I've got to get so damn good, why don't they have to get good too? Because I wanted everybody else to be having to do this hard job too. But see, I'm not responsible for another person's spiritual condition. I am only responsible for mine. And what I have tried to learn is, is that each and every person, whether I like them or not, whether they're a good person or not, is, is God's kid. And it is my responsibility to make amends to that person so I remain spiritually fit. I am only responsible for my spiritual condition. That's all. So it's necessary that I do that. Please, please, any amends that you're going to make, talk them over with somebody, with your AA sponsor, an AA sister, someone in the program, because it is not okay to go make amends to your ex-lover's wife. You know, we never get to be free at someone else's expense. All our amends are not to harm others. And if, we, if anything that's going to happen is going to harm somebody else, then you get to pack that one. You know, talk to another friend about them, but you can't take that one and go to the person. Because it's not right to hurt anybody else. We're supposed to be easy on others, the book says, and hard on ourselves. We don't do things that hurt other people. Now, I agree, there's a lot of people out there, certainly in my life, that deserve hurting. But it's not my job to do it. That's not my job. I am not the person who is their judger, nor am I the person who is to be their punisher. And that was really hard for me, because I felt like somebody ought to do it, and it might as well be me. <laughs> so those are... So make sure that you talk things over. Does anybody have any questions on that? Yes. Yeah, what about um, the fact that the, you didn't like a person and there was, you just can't go up to a person and say, I, I didn't like you for a whole lot of years. Or, you know, I get real confused on that because a lot of people I was real silent. But that doesn't mean I didn't go out and find them. Okay. Good evening and all that kind of stuff. Okay, what she's saying is, what do you do with a person who you don't like, and you didn't like when you were really silent, and you had the feelings inside, even though you didn't tell them? How do you make amends to them? Because I imagine they could tell by my actions, actions that I didn't like being around them or being them, but and they actually said or did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think in a situation like that, and you know, you can talk it over after you do uh, the amends, you know, when you do the inventory with whoever you choose to discuss it with. But what I would do is I would just say, you know, I'm really sorry for my behavior. Sometime I became very quiet 
and I'm sure that that, you know, and that might have offended you, and for that I'm really sorry. You don't have to go tell somebody, you know, what a rotten SOB they are. That's why I was acting like that. <laughs> so, but other words, you make, what you're going to do is you're going to make restitution for your behavior. Because in a sense, you had a lot of control over that person and probably knew it by your behavior. I know I certainly did. I could control a lot of people by sitting there and pouting. They knew I was angry. And I just played with it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm away. Did, did you still? <laughs> I keep walking around. I'm sorry. I'm these, I don't know what to do with this confinement with these mics. I'm sorry. Yes? She said, after I make the amends, then I have to live the amends. In other words, treat the person kindly and act as if I'm, you know, I'm sincere about the amends. The book says that, that we are supposed to treat that person with kindness and consideration. In other words, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about love. We get a lot of mixed messages, a lot of us who come to this program. Somebody says, I love you, and they punch your face in. You know, uh, somehow or another, I don't think that's love. If I love someone, I act as if I love someone. That love is an action. And amends is a living amends also. Just because I say it, if I go and say, I'm sorry about the feelings I had about you and my silence, and then I go outside and I start saying, well, I made amends to her, but, you know, she's, you boy, blah, 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 and just start taking your inventory again. I am not living it, and I am not going to have any relief from it, and you're going to know it. I mean, isn't it just amazing how we all have this little sensor in here, and you just know? I call it my God spot, and I think this little spot in here, and the longer we're sober and the more we practice step 11, the more intense this little, you know, this little voice gets, and you just know when somebody means what they say or if they're just there to look good. See, there you, see that way we'd have to inventory that because there we go manipulating again. You know, one more time, I'm manipulating to get your approval. <clears throat> Man, it's hard to stay sober. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Well, I think she's asking, what age are you responsible when you, you know, when you've been abused as a child? I think a lot of it is going to be have to, you know, doing your own writing, talking, because when, when did, you know, you start, start using it for your benefit and when was it abuse? Okay, I mean, when did it become a manip manipulation? Because that happens to a lot of people who have had those kind of violations, that it ends up, they've been violated and they turn it around and then they become the violator. That's perf that's, if there's anything like it's, that's a normal reaction to that kind of abuse. And I think a lot of it's going to be in your own writings, and a lot of it is talking it over with someone else. You know, these are heavy issues, and that's why it's so necessary to work these issues out with an AA sponsor, with a minister, with a counselor, whoever you can, you know, can work with. Because at some point, it's, you know, you're going to still today have to take responsibility to your reactions today from what happened. But when was it, when is it a reaction to what happened, and when does it become your action? And I think those are the kind of things that you, it's going to, each person will be different. You know, some people are 17 years old, and they don't have any more responsibility than a 5-year-old. And then there are some people who are 10 years old, and they have a maturity level that is far and away different. So every person is different.
Right, exactly. Okay, she said she doesn't believe that anybody should have to take responsibility, even if, if a child is 10 years old, they're still under the control of the parents. And even if they're living in the house and they're 21 years old, they're still under the control of the parent. There's, I have a little bit of disagreement with part of that. But at... <clears throat> Right, exactly. Well, that's what I'm trying to say to her. Different pe it's different for different people, and that's what she's saying. Just because somebody is 21 years old and they've been in that house and they've been groomed by that parent, just because they turn 18 doesn't instantly make them an adult. I couldn't agree with that more. I totally agree with that. And that's why I think that each person needs to do... See, some people leave home at 13 years old and maybe they do something different. Some people are trapped in a house and they may be 30 and no more responsible for their actions than a nine-year-old. So I think all of those things are something that needs to be weighed. It's an individual thing. You know, I totally agree with you because, see, you don't know how that person, I mean, it's kind of like being in a concentration camp, you know. You don't know any better unless you've been out of the concentration camp. If you've never been out, you don't know there's anything but the concentration camp. Yes. I grew up in that home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I've gone through all this, and I've gone through it myself, and I've been through it forever. And the thing is, is that all of us who grew up like that, we've been total responsible for everything that happened to us. Mm -hmm. And then as we grow and we start doing the work, then you get to sort that out and you realize that we Right. Exactly. It is. It's a very difficult thing to do, Jill. And she's, she's saying, you know, that this happened to her. And as you do the work, you know when it changed, when you changed from being a victim until you changed to being the offender. We all know where that, where that change happens. And I think it's true. Little kids, if there's something going wrong in your house, you do. You know that because a child is self-centered, that's the way a child is supposed to be. So if all this horrid is going on in your house, you know for sure that you're responsible for it. So as a child, sometimes we take total responsibility and don't even see that we're a victim. So all of this stuff, it's, it takes time to sort it out. Because I did, I just knew that my daddy was angry, hitting on my mother because of something I did. Right. Right, exactly. Right. Right, and, where does, and where, where does it begin and end? And I think that's all about what recovery is. And it's really hard because it's, it's a difficult place. And some of us have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hurt to work through and to know what, what am I responsible for, what am I not responsible for, and uh, where did I have no power and no control? What was I powerless over? And what does the book say? My dilemma was a lack of power. And a little child is certainly in that dilemma. Even though I may feel like I had so much power that that family was totally doing all those things and I was responsible. That's the way I felt, that I was responsible. And, it, and you know, it's like this is, this is such a generality. That, and what happens is, is we're talking in generalities about some, that's a, those are heavy issues. We're talking in a generality about very personal things. And it's really hard to put, you know, it needs to be discussed on an individual basis. That's why you don't go do fist steps and come to the podium and tell them. 
you sit down one on one because everybody's life is different. Everybody's issues are different. And it can become, you know, people can become enraged when you talk in generalities because they're saying, wait a minute, you don't know what happened to me. And, and it's like, yeah, we need to wait a minute. We don't know what happened to them so that we can stop and listen to that. I'm wondering if you see any difference between... <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Including those things which are our assets or things we can draw from, mm -hmm. supplies we can draw from, who we may not have recognized, and that we may have in fact undervalued. As a sponsor in al I have a lot of and I think this happened to me when I did my own, that that part of my disease, which is martyrdom and self-blame, just goes for it, doing an inventory, mm -hmm. because I can find so much uh, that is wrong, or in, in the past that's been true. But when I'm working with sponsees in the al program, I find that the uh, that this sense of depression, of debilitation, this exaggerated view of one's own negativity is a kind of, it, it's a real root in many Alamon people that I know. And so you've been talking about addressing the AA side. I, I kind of feeling that maybe the mm -hmm. intended to say Alamon and AA. But I I just I just wonder if you have any uh, insights about that, about those differences. Okay, she's talking about an Alanon inventory. And have I taken an Alanon inventory? I want to answer yes to that. And is there any difference? And I don't believe that there is any difference. I am, I am very, very clear for me, now this may not be clear for anybody else, that you sober up an alcoholic and you have got a flaming Al-Anon. <laughs> because what is the difference? What is the difference? One of us drank and one of us didn't. But once we get, once we get through with the drinking, I believe all of the emotional sobriety is the same. And I think that then those things, now, I can, you know, there are many, many alcoholics who have just as much disease of perfectionism. Now, we could sit here and start talking, talking about perfectionism of the overeaters in here. Well, you talk about perfectionism comes with eating disorder. I mean, but I have perfectionism, both from my AA disease and my disease of Al-Anon. And one of the things that I think is so necessary when we're doing inventories, which one more time is why I say it's not a generality, it's an individual thing, which is why we do it with people, is that somebody can say, stop already. You know, you have, this is just, this is ceasing to be an inventory and, a flag and it's starting to be a flagellation, okay? This is starting to be uh, your character defects. You know, you start, you need to put down, we need to talk about this character defect you have of having this need to beat yourself up. So, you know, what I am resentful at myself. I can't accept myself. Most of the things that I can't, that was the whole thing. I couldn't accept the imperfections in me. I had a hard time doing that, which is why I would go to a mirror and see nothing. I couldn't accept me. And I think those are, the, those are part of the things that we need to work on. And I, I agree with you 100% because I can do that. I can do that here thinking, you know, here I come to this conference, I should have all this stuff being prepared, and then I can just say, oh my God, I didn't have those copies, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And I can get into that spiral one more time of what we're talking about, of just, you know, just get out the whip and beat up on myself. I never knew what they talked about, you know, that one man died on the, you know, on the cross, you know, Polly, put yours down, because I would do the same thing. Needing to be right, and I don't think that that's—I don't think that that's an Al-Anon trait. 
just, you know, I see, this is my feelings. Now, there are a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that are never going to agree with me about it. You know, you sober up an alcoholic and you got a flaming Al-Anon, because they don't want to believe they have anything to do with Al-Anons. I am, I am a caretaker of people. Now, I drank alcohol to the point that the, I was pronounced dead on arrival with the disease, yet I am still a caretaker of people. Now, what, what is an Al-Anon? A caretaker of people. Now, there may not, some of us AA women may not be that, but I believe a lot of us are. You know, what I can't understand is how did you live through it without a drink? <laughs> <laughs> pain by God I'd take a drink <laughs> that's always been a mystery to me <laughs> yes she asked if codependency meetings were the same as Al-Anon meetings uh, to tell you the truth I do not know I believe that they're similar, and I believe that there are people in there who do not come from alcoholic, you know, homes, but maybe they come from, you know, like workaholism and, you know, a lot of, you know, gamblers and workaholics and all of those things. That's just, you know, anything that, that separates you emotionally from the people you love and care for. It's, it's you know... And I think that's what codependency is, is all about in their meeting. So I, I know they use the 12 steps. Is that right? Yes. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of it that, that revolves around Al Anon, but there's a lot of more depth to the in a different area. And like, there again, you have to sit in the meetings to be able to understand what it's all about. But generally, it's a caretaker again. You know, so. it's, it's when helping others. When she says it's, it, Julia is saying that the codependency meetings are all, you know, are a lot the same, but it's all about the same as Al-Anon. When, when, when I, when, when helping you starts to hurt me, and one of, <clears throat> one of the things that I like to remember as an AA sponsor, which I think has a lot to do with my, with my Al-Anon and where I learned, was when I start putting more into your program than you put into your program, we need to talk about it. <laughs> Because I can end up working more on your program than you work on it. And I find myself doing that a lot. So I have had to learn to detach. And that was really hard for me to do. And allow you to not get sober or not get better if that's what you choose to do. It is absolutely your choice. But see, I was so eager to have people absolutely get better no matter what that I felt like I had to do it. And today I have to realize my husband says something that helped me so much. And he said, Polly, you don't have the right to deny somebody their pain because that pain is what will get them better. And then Bill says, and as Bill sees it, pain is the touchstone of all spiritual growth. Yes. She, <laughs> she said, <laughs> I love it. I love it, E.T. That's great. She said, if alcoholics are looked at as selfish and self-centered people, are Al-Anons looked at that way too? Go ask an Al-Anon what their primary purpose was. Their primary purpose is to say, look what I've done for you. <laughs> <laughs> Without me, you'd never make it. <laughs> and see, that's who I was too. My poor husband who's got congestive heart failure. I'm walking around in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, sober alcoholics, saying he'll die if I don't take care of him. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Sure they do. And she's asked, do not men have that same dual thing? I mean, I just shared with somebody yesterday who's having a lot of problems because of that. It's the same thing. Men have it just like, you know, one of the things I, I know that, you know, we've got, we're doing a lot of growing as women. And we're doing a lot of changing as women. But I'm here to tell you that alcoholism, al anonism and all this is not gender biased. It has nothing to do with gender. Now, when it, what happened was it just, you know, women were alcoholics always, but we were kind of, we were hidden. Thank God alcoholism was out in the open or I would have died from the disease of alcoholism because I was not out where people could see me like a man who went to work every day. I was a real estate agent and you know I could I was pretty autonomous, had a lot of autonomy. But men have these same problems. When it comes to disease, this disease, alcoholism, the disease and alcoholism it's it's whether alcoholism is about drinking or not drinking. Al Anon is about the disease of alcoholism. And the book is very clear to say that alcohol is but a symptom. The disease is the ism. If alcoholism was just about drinking, then detox centers would send out sober people, never to have to deal with anything again. Alcohol is what we do because of what's going on. The difference is, is the al have the same thing going on, they just don't drink. I never understood that, but they don't drink. They have other things. I mean, they get satisfaction other ways. But men have that, too. It's the same. Well, I tried my, with my husband drank. I tried to drink with it. And it didn't give me, apparently, it mm -hmm. gave you. Right. All that did was put me to sleep. Right. <laughs> and she's saying that she tried to drink with her husband, and it didn't do for her what it did for me. And that's true. That's the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. Because alcohol, see, everybody's always saying, Polly, look what alcohol does to you. But I'm trying to scream, you don't know what it does for me. Because it didn't do for you. And it's just like these things we have about, you know, legal drinking and illegal drinking. Non-alcoholics don't build a tolerance. So they don't, I mean, they can't drink enough to blow a point one zero. So when people are start saying, I just had a bad day, bullshit. <laughs> They've built a tolerance. You threw up once if you drank too much and you said, well, I'll never do that again. Not me. We'll just do it till we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep trying. This feels too good. I'm not about to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you, what we're talking about is after you remove the chemical, after we're sober, sitting in rooms like this, this is what I love about woman to woman, that when we get rid of the chemical and we're left with the feelings, the feelings are the same. And I believe that with all my heart. Now, you may disagree with me. That's my opinion. That's not in the book. So that's my opinion. But I think when we get rid of that and what's left, we feel alike. <clears throat> now, we come to step 10. 10, 11, and 12 have been called the maintenance steps. And in 10, it says, continue to take personal, personal inventory, and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. Now, what that does for me is it says, I take an inventory. So that means... That if I, if I don't need to write it out, maybe I can just think about it, you know, as I lay down and go to sleep at night. But sometimes I may need to put it on paper. Because I can tell you that there are days that I can build some big resentments. Somebody can do something to me, hurt my feelings, step on my toe, and I'm, and I'm truly pissed off. And I need to write it out, just like we did here. I need to, you know, I am resentful, what's the cause, and take a look at it. Because I'm so biased as to what they've done to me, I can't see my part in it. So I need to write it out. And then when I'm wrong, promptly admit it. What is that? Step nine. 
So what happens is, is step 10 keeps me up to date. Step 10 keeps me living in the here and now. And if I continue to take personal inventory, and if I work step 10 on a daily basis, probably I'm not going to have to go back and take an in-depth fourth and fifth step again. But if I don't stay current, and it's just like, you know, in a, if I don't take, you know, if I don't do an inventory on a pretty much daily basis, then here late I'm going to, you know, pile it up. And that happens to me. I'll let it stack up because I'm in the human condition. I have not been anointed sainthood. And I let it stack up and I have to go back and do a whole fourth and fifth again. Because pretty soon I'm at it him, her, it, that. And I've got all this stuff going and a tenth step just ain't going to do it. But keep abreast, and then it doesn't pile up so much. And I'm not a person, it's like I don't believe that. For me, some people need to take a fourth, a fourth and fifth every year. I personally don't do that. I personally have taken two in 15 years. I try to stay current with 10. I try to make 10 something I do on a daily basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, who am I angry at? Me, my behavior. You know, I'm angry at me. What's the cause? Because I talk about people behind their back. What does that affect? It affects my self-esteem. It affects my personal relationships. I mean, it, it chews me up. And then uh, what, what am I looking for? I'm self-seeking. I'm dishonest. You know, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to like me better than them. I'm self-seeking. And then I have to go up and, you know, tell that person. You know, I said some things about you that aren't true, and I'm really sorry. And how I follow through with that is I go tell the other person that I told that I did it. That's sometimes even harder. Ho oh, ho, guess what? What I told you is not true. God, I hate that stuff. <laughs> I, you know, I get so in touch with how prideful I am. I don't mind being convinced with things that I did when I was drinking. I just don't like the things that I have to do now. <laughs> she, said, she said she doesn't like to make amends for the things she's done when she was drinking. She just doesn't like to make amends for the things she's done now. Well, one of the things that about me and my drinking is I was one of these people that laid on my sofa. So what I did is I did a lot of damage to my family. Now that I'm sober, I run havoc through everybody's life. So I get to make, I get to make amends a lot. I do worse with the here and now than I did with the, you know, than I had with the past. Sometimes I'll say, but my God, I'm sober. How could I have done this? I have a program. I'm on a spiritual path. How did that happen? I'm alive. As a guy said, if you're not making any mistakes today, you're not doing enough. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sue Ellen says it's back to that thing that we were talking about with Keith L. that says it's a spiritual experience to admit when you're wrong, and when you say I'm sorry, it's a spiritual experience. I understand that because sometimes it, it just, I want to justify it so bad because I just, I, I mean, that is my disease. I just have this need to be right. And it's okay to be wrong because if I'm wrong, it means I can learn. If I'm always right, I have nothing to learn. That, hum, that humility again. Right, to be humble. And that's it. And that's the main thing. The more slack, that's the main thing, point I want to make too, Sue Ellen. The main thing is the more slack you cut yourself, the more slack you'll cut other people. And the more you can get in touch with your own, you know, shortcomings, that's the main thing is you get in touch with your own shortcomings and then you can let other people have shortcomings too. Because it's back to that old thing, you cannot give away what you don't have. 
And if you don't have any forgiveness of self and don't have any letting up on yourself, then we don't let up on others. We have too high expectation on other people. Right, Rule 62, just don't take yourself so damn seriously. Mm-hmm. Because it really does help me to embrace my character defects. You know, not that I love them or I'm crazy about them, but they're who I am. A lot of them still. You know, and when I try to like just give them all to God and forget about it, mm-hmm. you know, they're not really there, that thing. The self hatred was so real strong when I was deep decked out, so to speak, you know. And then since I've been um I kind of figured that if God can take the good and the bad she was talking about the seven step prayer that it's really helped her to let up on herself and to accept herself and to accept her character defects one of the things that I, I, I just love what she said because I think a lot of times when we read the seven step prayer that we forget about that, you know, last night I was talking about everybody makes a difference. And, and we talk about it in the seven step prayer. It says, my creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and, bra- good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Do you know I may have some character defects going on that God needs for me to have because he's using them. And that was pointed out to me. And until that was pointed out to me, it's like, oh, my God. So, see, we go back to if we truly take a step seven, it's not any of my business what God removes because there may be something there. You know, me going back and gossiping and keep making amends may be some kind of example to people who are gossiping and and not making amends. Everything is of use to God. There is no negatives. But my perception of it, I may not see it that way, but you are absolutely right, and that reminded me of that, because God is using that, every bit of me, the good and the bad, and the only person that's judging the good and the bad is me. That bad may be be working for God perfectly. Have you ever sat in a meeting and seen somebody doing something and knew that's what you didn't want to do? And that what they did was as much benefit to you as if they were doing everything right? You betcha. You betcha. Exactly. It works. So when we take, when we take a seventh step, that's all. It, there's, it, the seventh step is so, we do this, we say this prayer, and the seventh step says we have then completed step seven. And I hear people walking around meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous say, I'm working on my character defects. <laughs> How do you do that? With a blunt instrument. <laughs> <laughs> she said, with a blunt instrument. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to con- continue my, conti- my conscious contact with God praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. And one of the things that I try to do is I try to give myself, I try to read some readings. My husband and I do this together in the morning. And we try to read some readings and to just sit quietly. And I love what I've heard in AA and Al-Anon meetings that, uh, that prayer is when I ask God and when I talk to God and meditation is when I listen. And... Um, Sometimes I don't, I'm not sure that I've ever, I often say God has never sent me a fax, so I don't get, you know, messages that way. But usually what happens is I'll, you know, I'll pray to God and I'll ask for some guidance. And lo and behold, from left field, from God knows where, here comes somebody with the answer. And it is, it is, I can see God working in my life constantly like that. It just happens. I ask for help, and it's, I just invariably get it. It never comes the way I thought it would come. It always comes in very mysterious ways. 
but I always get the answers that I need if I ask. And what I try to do is do just what the book says, to be of maximum service to God and others. And I truly believe that God answers prayers. I just believe that with all my heart, that God answers prayers. And I believe that there's power in prayers. And when I have you know, something going on, I ask people to pray. I used, to, I used to stand behind podiums of Alcoholics Anonymous and ask for people to pray for my son, Russ. And I know without a doubt that the very reason that he's doing as well as he's doing today is because of the prayers that were sent up in rooms just like this. I believe in the power of prayer. And, those, and I believe that he answers the prayer. <clears throat> And I, you know, I, there's a lot of people who get more direct, you know, messages from God. For me, God as I understand him speaks to me through the people. That's the way I, that's the way it works for me. And there will be times when I have these intuitive feelings, but what I try to do is discuss them with another person. And it just keeps going on. And once I was told, every time you mention God, or your higher power that is a conscious contact. So it doesn't have to be just in the morning or just at night. You can talk to God as you understand him all day long. But any time you do that, it's a conscious contact. The 12 steps says having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I carried this message to other alcoholics and practice these principles in all my affairs. I know today that, the we, that why I have the things I have is a direct result of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, that, they, that it's taking a set of actions that is necessary to produce a spiritual awakening. And I truly believe that, these, that the 11 steps are, are, <coughs> is, a, is action that can produce a spiritual awakening. There has been a lot of times that I have had to take actions contrary to the way I felt. But by taking those actions, you know, just because I feel like I don't want to do it doesn't mean I don't do it. But taking those actions, and that is what is necessary to produce a spiritual awakening. And then what I do is I go practice these principles in all my affairs. And I'm here to tell you it is not tough for me to be spiritual and wonderful in this room. It's real easy. But I guarantee you when I get on an L.A. freeway, sometimes it gets real hard not to flip a guy off. <laughs> it's real hard to practice these principles in all my affairs. That's when my program is at the test. And I can tell you where it becomes the greatest test is when I take this program into my marriage. Because the person that I tend to abuse and neglect and to do the less and to do my program the least with is my husband. I have time for everybody I sponsor. I have time for all of this stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'll look around and the one person that I haven't taken any time for is Dave. And I'm pulled up short on that many a time. But you see, that's what I do because I have to be reminded of that character defect of my fear of intimacy. That the person I love the most tends to be the person I neglect the most. So it becomes real necessary for me to practice these principles at home with Dave. And then when I go out on a freeway to try to be nice and say, certainly you can come in. <laughs> Move right in. Oh, hello. Thank you. <laughs> and I grow a little bit when I can do that. So, Okay, the next session that we're going to do, we're going to talk on uh, some, uh, we're going to talk about emotional sobriety and some of the, uh, the things that are uh, defects and what the remedies are. And then we're going to talk about doing some writing, not inventory writing, just writing, <clears throat> so that we can get, s there's a lot of things that we have intuitively that come to us, and it can come in writing. And uh, 
we'll do that this evening. That's what I asked for the extra 15 minutes for because you know you can't put that on tape. We're going to do that after we do the speaking. Does anybody else have anything that they want to add? Yes. Okay. Everybody stay put after this meeting. We have some announcements. Is there any and Laura has one. Is there any other is there anything else before we can shut this one down? Anybody have anything else to add? Thank you, thank you, ladies. We'll see you tonight. Have fun this afternoon. Okay, gang. This is gonna be the uh the writing session at the end of this is what we're going to do. So you're going to need pe pencil and paper, and I need some help passing out. I've got stuff again. Stuff again. We're going to do emotional sobriety. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is, uh, when I found out I was going to be doing these retreats, I have a wonderful Al-Anon sponsor, and she sent me this material. So uh, I'd just like us to go over it, and I've, it's got the sources there, and it's, uh, we get the stuff from Alcoholics Anonymous, the ODAT, Stools and Bottles, Who Are You?, and the rest of it is just hard-earned personal experience. And we're going to talk about emotional sobriety. And one of the things that has been very clear to me in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon is to know the truth, and the truth will set me free. But also the main thing is, is that I am not free as long as I am blaming others and not taking responsibility. And so, if I can take responsibility for my own actions, my own feelings, I never even wanted to be responsible for my feelings, my reactions. When I can start to take responsibility for those, I can begin to be set free and to grow and not to be bogged down with all that ick of the past. <clears throat> okay, let's just let's just do some let's just do some reading and we'll just go on and everybody can just kind of find their way in and we'll just get started. <clears throat> this is just a statement that um, that I liked and I just put it in here. I can be myself when I am in a situation I like. Can I be myself when I'm in a situation I don't like? And that's what's really neat, is that I can be myself either way. And that's, uh, other words, again, that's that maturity and the difference in a child, is that even though I don't like what's going on, I can still be myself and be happy. It is easy to, in solitude to live after our own opinion, but the great man or woman is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. Other words, it's, you know, it's, it's very risky for me to come here over the weekend and to tell you my p opinions and my feelings because what I do is I take a risk that someone is not going to agree and someone is not going to approve of me. And it's very difficult for a person like me to maintain my own independence if you dareth not agree with me. And that's been very hard for me. I think we talked about that earlier because I would sell myself out for you to approve of me. And I'm so grateful today that I don't sell myself out for you to approve of me, that I can maintain what I believe in but you know what is even nicer is that I can let you believe in what you want to believe in. The live and let live syndrome. And that if you find a way that works for you and it doesn't happen to be my way, that I can allow you to do that without taking in all this resentment and all, this, all those icky feelings because you're not doing it my way. 
And that was always, if you didn't agree with me, I took everything personal. So if you didn't agree with me, then you didn't like me. And hopefully most of the time I don't do that anymore. Let's do some clarification of terms. Emotion. And these come from uh, the Standard College Dictionary. A strong surge of feeling marked by an impulse to outward expression and often accompanied by complex bodily reaction. <laughs> like a total fit. <laughs> Intoxication, to be made drunk, to elate or excite. And the, and the medical term for that is to poison. Some of us alcoholic women can certainly identify with that. Sober, not drunk, temperate, moderate, quiet, calm, sensible, free from exaggeration and distortion. <laughs> <laughs> If we live truly, we shall see truly. It is as easy for the strong man to be strong as it is for the weak man to be weak. My goodness, do you mean that I am standing here and I have choices? I am not a victim and I can choose to be strong or I can choose to be weak? My goodness, I never knew that. When we have new perception, we shall gladly disburden the memory of its horrid treasures. Hoarded. Hoarded. Say it again. Hoarded. Hoarded treasures. Thank you. My English is bad sometimes, and you're German, and you do better than I do. <laughs> twice as hard. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> AAs and Al Anons discover. If they want the Al-Anon and AA way of life, they must become willing to go to any length to get it. Then you are ready to take certain steps. To stop ourselves from drinking and stinking thinking, we recognize these as symptoms and seek to get to the underlying causes of our physical addiction and mental obsessions. Most of us discover that a major cause of our living problems stem from emotional immaturity. We seem to be people who have no defense against the onslaughts of misguided feelings. And we tend to go to extremes, usually some kind of escape in coping with emotional pain and discomfort. I'm sure none of you identify with any of that. <laughs> We become aware after coming to the program that the intoxicants we need to be on the alert for, <clears throat> alert for are not beer, wine, whiskey, vodka, tequila, gin, or other narcotics, but the emotional intoxicants. Anger, intolerance, self-pity, resentment, jealousy, dishonesty, plus self-deception, criticism, fear, depression, and blame. <clears throat> Any of y'all been drunk lately? <laughs> so we're going to talk about emotional sobriety and see how many of these we've been drunk on. Anger, a deadly poison to sanity and serenity, a special punch to those who want to be God in their own lives. Its impact succeeds in obliterating reason and self-control. One can enjoy being a human hurricane while plunged into the depths of this emotional intoxicant. Sometimes the debris left after this storm is staggering. <clears throat> the big book talks about us being, you know, like bulls in a china shop and how anger. That's, you know, and it's, it's all those negative feelings. And I think about today, you know, what a good man my dad is or was. He's dead now. But what the thing that I brought to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I could remember the most was his anger. It just overshadowed. I let, you know, I let it overshadow anything else. It is a, anger is a devastating, a devastating and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about anger needs to be left to those who can handle it. We're just not people who deal with anger very well. 
And it's, it's just something that is devastating to people. It hurts people. And you know what it does to the people that we're angry at and the people that receive it? And look at what it does to me. Have, just think about the last time you were angry. My gosh, your stomach hurts, your head hurts, your neck hurts. I mean, it just, it, it's no wonder that people die. You know, you can get cancer from that kind of anger, heart attacks. Mercy, it'll eat your very being up. The remedy, it's just one whiff of anger sets up the compulsion to act on it. Practice total abstinence. Should the compulsion to get the upper hand, third and fifth step it when sanity has returned. The strength to res resist taking the first drink of anger comes from daily use of the 12 steps, slogans, and willingness to assume responsibility for one's own conduct. And here it comes one more time of I have to take responsibility for my own actions and my own feelings. And I was a person who was never willing to be responsible for my feelings. You, it was your responsibility to make me happy. And today I have to realize that it is my responsibility and I am responsible for my actions. Children, little kids are not responsible, but grown women are. Intolerance, an emotional inebriate which fouls up 12-step work. It succeeds in blocking awareness of what has been shared with one in the program. It causes emotional bias and prejudice. And we were talking about that earlier. It's uh, one of the things, and I'll just share this with you. I don't talk a whole lot, but my youngest son got sober in the program of adult children of alcoholics. And a lot of times I don't say a lot about that because that seems to just fire people in Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon right off is any time anybody talks about ACA. And what I learned was, see, I got that bit of judgment taken away from me because, you see, without that program, my son might not be here. And so I had to quit judging that everybody has a right. And see, I don't know what your contract is with God. And I don't know if that's the best road for you. I knew nothing about live and let live. I was an intolerant, judgmental person. And today I'm trying to allow those kind of feelings to slip away from me. Because the more I do that, the more closed down I am. And I, and I miss an opportunity to learn when I shut my mind off. Remedy, daily doses of live and let live, plus an open mind. Seek to develop compassion, the highest form of emotional maturity. How hard is it to be compassionate to someone that we know or we feel has harmed us? How hard is that to be? It's very difficult to feel compassion. <clears throat> Begin with self-compassion, that is, be good to yourselves. And one of the things that I have learned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon is, you cannot give that which you do not have. The gentler I am on myself, the gentler I'll be on you. The more I cut myself some slack, the more I can cut you some slack. And my expectations of you are not quite so high. Self-compassion means realizing the meaning, quality, and intensity of one's own emotions. The emotional identification of self enables you to feel with others. Learn to distinguish between a person and his behavior and detach from the problem, but not the person. And one of the things that I love about the program of Al-Anon is that Al-Anon may hate the disease of alcoholism, but they love the person who has the disease. B. 
big difference. And what I always did, and what the message I always sent my children, was when I would say things to them about bad behavior, instead of identifying their behavior against them, what I would say would be things like, you're a terrible little boy. And see, you, you give somebody a message like that enough times, and they believe they're terrible. What I know now, but I didn't know then was, as I was to talk about their behavior, not the person. And what happens is, and what I have found with myself and my sons, is if you criticize them, it's not, they don't feel like you're just talking about their behavior. They feel like you're talking about their whole being. And those are the messages we send, and we don't mean to send them. And I had a spiritual awakening one year. We were in Yosemite, and Julia was there too. And Julia had climbed up to the top of Yosemite Falls through all the water. And there was this lady with these two little boys, and they were about eight or ten years old. And those little boys were climbing around on the rocks. And I was listening to this woman, and she was saying, you can do it, keep going, reach out, there you go, what, you know, you're doing a great job, keep on. And I just had a spiritual awakening for me because I saw myself and I saw the messages I had sent my sons, which is, be careful, don't fall, watch out. And the message I sent them was, you can't do it. And someone told me last night, and I believe this, words are powerful. And the words we say are powerful. So we need to be very careful. And that's where anger and intolerance, you think about it, in a, in a moment of anger, we can say things that we can never take back. Once they're said, they're said. Remedy. <laughs> oh, I gave that. Learn to distinguish the person between his behavior. Okay, we did that one. The next intoxicant is self-pity. This is mine with a capital S. My God, I felt so sorry for myself. Poor me. Pour me another drink. <clears throat> One sip of this fairly slow-acting emotional intoxicant can lead to distorted perspective. My perception of reality is distorted. Giant mountains mushroom out of little tiny molehills. I don't know about your thinking, but give me a little bitty problem. It takes one walk through my brain, and I've got a trauma. <clears throat> Problems are magnified, and calamities loom on all sides. The drunkenness progresses to the crying stage, and the dialogue runs. Nobody loves me, boo-hoo-hoo. Nobody appreciates me, boo-hoo. Nobody cares, boo-hoo. Nobody recognizes how hard I try. Everybody is against me. I can't do anything right. I might as well just be dead. <laughs> Set to, this, to a mournful tune, these lines are played over and over in a half-dark, gloomy, and unswept mental hangout. At the center of self-pity is a half-grown kin having a slobbering, blubbering temper fit at God, self, circumstances, and people. As long as he can keep the drunk tears flowing, he does not have to leave and go out into the light. How many times I have been told, as I would call my AA sponsor, crying in one of these emotional fits and her to say something to me that would send me straight up. Polly, you are feeling so sorry for yourself. You are sitting on a fur-lined pity pot. And it's like, I want to hang up. You don't understand me. Why did I choose you? You don't have any idea what's... And I can just perpetuate the whole thing. Self-pity is devastating. It is so self-destructive. Remedy. Hourly doses of daily gratitude, appreciation, and admission of God's grace. 
Stop hanging out in mental dumps. Stop keeping company with the bad companions of resentment, fear, and selfishness. Don't flirt with self-justification and self-righteousness, which will sweet-talk you into a dive. Total abstinence is hardly possible unless the self-pity trips are replaced with being others-centered. Substitute daily contacts with a higher power and group members for the frequent visits of the self-pity bars. Tough stuff, huh? Whew. Of course, growth and change, and change brings us pain, but we have already been steeped in personal pain anyway, and it was a pain of destruction. Pain from growth and change is productive, and we become winners rather than losers by it. To achieve emotional sobriety, then we need only, and the next one is called self-motivation. And I can't think of another thing that is more self-motivating to me than for me to watch another woman in this program able to do the things that I could never do. Experience strength and hope because to watch other women walk through things that I could never walk through or felt like I could never walk through has been my hope. And I love this program. The program is a program of attraction instead of promotion. And I came from a background of where everything was promotion. People said one thing and in my perception did another. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as we hear so many times, is you get to see miracles instead of hear about miracles. Self-motivation, a clinical term for, damn it, I'm tired of hurting, and I'm desperate enough to do anything to stop the pain. <laughs> Courage and backbone, guts and gumption, willingness and common sense, Recogni recognition that process is the journey and perfection is the destination and that we have a long way to go before we get there. And one of the things that I loved in the program when I got here was this is not a destination, it's a journey. And I guess if I ever reach perfectionism, it'll be time to go. And I love that because all along the journey, we get so many experiences, and these are opportunities to grow. And if I can change these painful experiences into opportunities to grow, I can look at it in a different way. I know there's been a lot of times that I've sat around, you know, screaming at God, gosh, I just think I've grown enough, you know. I'm ready to rest on my laurels. It's been enough. But I guess it just hasn't been enough because I continue to need these experiences. Why should we assume the fault of our friend, wife, husband, father, mother, or child because they sit around on hearth, are said to have the same blood, the power men possess to annoy me, I give them by a weak curiosity, by Emerson. And that's the thing. I look around and I think because just because somebody is the same blood, I'm going to be just like them. I always thought that. Who, how many times have you grown up and your mother said you're going to be just like your father or just or your father or somebody said you're just like your mother and then you go around and you're sure of it and you can't stand them? So you just give up and don't try? The solutions rest with me. People can affect me only as I allow them to. I need not be influenced by others, for I am free to consult my own wishes and standards. With the help of my higher power, I can adorn my life with comfort, serenity, and enjoyment. It does not depend on any other person, and the sooner I accept this fact, the sooner I will be able to face myself realistically. What an order. I can't go through with it. <clears throat> the solution is in me. And I can remember when I first w became aware, and I was able, to, by the help of many people in Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon, 
to tell my children, and by telling them I could accept that for myself, was that my, your problems have my name on it, but your solutions have yours. I can do nothing for your solutions. I can own what I did as a parent, but I can do nothing for you except be the very best example I can be because you're an adult now. If we have a desire to stop or at least diminish emotional slips and binges brought to the surface, to the surface and aggravated by the problem of alcoholism, then we are ready to say to ourselves, half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We ask his protection and care with complete abandon. There is no way that I can give up these old ideas and these character defects without the help of a power greater than myself. I don't believe, maybe some people can, but to me I don't believe that that's possible. In and of myself, the book says it, in and of myself I am nothing, the Father doeth the works. The very best I could do for me is to get me pronounced dead on arrival. But because of this program and what we do, I'm, I'm a free woman today. The miracle. Finding ourselves locked in the intoxicating grip of certain emotions and suffering the pain and hangover from these, we found it necessary to learn which ones are so poisonous and threatening to our emotional sobriety and serenity. We learn that to avoid these emotions and their crippling effects, that we can act our way into right thinking by saying to ourselves, if I were not jealous, depressed, etc., what would I be thinking, feeling, doing? We step out on faith, asking God's guidance, and easy does it, but do it. And this is one of the things that I learned when I came into the program. It's like you act your way into good thinking. You don't think your way into good living. So what happens is, in order to have good living, I must first, what did I say? Did I say it wrong? <laughs> I have to act myself into good thinking. I cannot think myself into good living. And what I was, you hear in this program, act as if. Act as if. And a lot of times we get that all bent around, well, I'm supposed to tell the truth, that's dishonest, if I don't do this, it's not acting as if. And, you know, there's just, you have to learn to discern which of these, you know, what's, what's truly lying and what's truly trying to change a negative thought into a positive thought. And you can't think your way into doing it. You have to act your way into doing it. You can't think your way. So it takes an action. And it's really wonderful because if you keep doing it, then it's what the book says, that repetition strengthens and confirms, and then faith then comes naturally. One day you wake up and you just don't feel that way anymore. And it's amazing. And the only thing that I know to tell people who are new is to just trust the process. This is a process. Trust the process. The following list is by no means a complete one of emotional mischief makers. However, One's recognition and treatment of these will certainly provide the strength, hope, and experience to overcome any others one day at a time, sometimes one moment at a time. A good beginning is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. For God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footprint upon the ocean and rides upon the storm. Resentment. I think the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous calls it the number one offender. An emotional intoxicant distilled from character defects guaranteed to impede progress in steps 3 and 11. 
Drinking of resentment poises spiritual progress, often leads to emotional enslavement to the hated people and things. An effective way to stay drunk on resentment is to bar hop from anger to self-pity to intolerance to jealousy to fear, then home to an unbelievable hangover and depression. Wonderful drink. Makes you feel so good. Remedy, refuse to let one's serenity be drowned out by happenings that are themselves unimportant. Says Odat on page 266, nobody can hurt our feelings without permission. A daily step 10 keeps the system clear of clogged feelings about ourselves and others. And what I learned when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is I came here a victim. I was a victim of people, places, and things. And if you wanted to see my dander get ruffled, is when somebody told me that once you enter the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon, you are no more, you are no longer a victim, you are a volunteer. So, because I am responsible for how I feel, and I am responsible for how I act, for that, I am responsible. Remedy, refuse to let... Oh, I just said, said that. Jealousy. This happened to be my number one character defect, that if anybody was prettier than me, smarter than me, had more money than me, had a better-looking husband than me, thinner than me, you name it, anything that I perceived better than me, I was jealous, envious, lusted after it. I was just eaten up by everybody has it better than me. Mixed, you know, you take a little jealousy, stir it with self-pity, and boy, you got a great potion there. A powerful concoction of resentment, fear, self-pity, low self-esteem, and insecurity. Drinking freely and often from jealousy allows one to lose self-control. This mental blend diminishes peace of mind, dangerously threatens faith and trust in self and others. Jealousy brought into the program hurts the group unity and fellowship. I don't know about any of you, but I, if I was jealous of someone, I would with a smile sweetly say very unkind things about them. Now what do you suppose that does to the group and to people around? It is, it is not only tearing me into shreds, it tears everybody else into shreds. Remedy. Recovery is possible through daily attention to spiritual needs. Humility, daily injected, deprives the ritual effects of depresses the ritual effects of jealousy. Disperses. Thank you. A step four and a step five reveals the exact nature of one's compulsion to this green-eyed monster. Step six and seven also put to rout this insidious mind bender. Today, it's my barometer when those icky feelings, and I can't think of another word, but just icky feelings, I realize that the only relationship I need to pay any attention to is my relationship with God because it's that relationship which is not in order. And the big book says when my relationship is in order with God, I'm comfortable inside. And that jealousy can, the old term, eat my lunch. And I need to do everything I can to just whittle that little booger away. <clears throat> this is another one that uh, has caused me a lot of discomfort, and that's dishonesty and self-deception. You know, the person I have been most dishonest to all my life is me. I've told the biggest lies to myself, and the worst thing of all is I've believed them. Emotional intoxicants, much like champagne, seemingly harmless, laced sublately with relation, rel, rationalization and equivoc, equivocation. Say those words for me. Equivocation, did I get it right? Yay! Yay. Indulgence in this smooth, sophisticated, 
pair can cause one to cross over into crippling self-deceit with the greatest of ease. Its side effects make one feel sure he is not the maker of his own mischief. He cannot understand why his fringe benefits from the program are not coming to, me, coming to him as he sees him coming to somebody else. He cannot give up his secret drinking from this pair until he is brought painfully to the bottom. I don't know if any of you have bottomed out in sobriety and in the fellowship of Al-Anon, but I have hit major bottoms in dishonesty and self-deception. And probably the worst one for me was behind relationships and sex. I was just so certain that if you would just love me enough, then I would be okay. And I, had, and I lied to myself that it came from other people. If they would just love me enough, then I would be okay. Because, see, in and of myself, I hated myself, and I was, ma I was making you responsible for me feeling loved. Remedy. Recuperation from the DTs of dishonesty and self-deception requires accepting responsibility of self-change, release of manipulation of self and others. I don't know if there's any other manipulating women in this room, but I am absolutely, I was a manipulator. Da 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 da, I lost my recovery of, and a frequent spiritual retreats. Here we are. Recovery is noticeable when one can look oneself and others right in the eye, walk with purpose, and feel gratitude and humility f from steps one and two. Criticism, a superb social drink blended cheaply and generously of rumor, gossip, and secret glee with others' misfortune. Feels so good to smugly, poor thing. The accompanying hors d'oeuvres of self-righteousness is too good to resist. Such clatches drive, one away, drive away the newcomer has come on faith and good reports about the help to be found in AA and Al-Anon. He may go away thinking that the program has nothing special to offer after all. Have you ever walked into a meeting and, and you know, all these sanctimonious people were saying all these self-righteous things? What if there were a newcomer that walked in that day? Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Remedy. Read the prescription on one's own bottle of medicine. More than likely, it will say to pay attention to one's own needs for recovery. The contented, well-adjusted person has no need to look for flaws in others. AA and Al-Anon are fellowships of equals, neither, of equals. Neither brains, money, looks, prestige, education, cleverness, nor the lack of these kept alcohol, alcoholism and its effects away from us. I don't know about you, but the last time I looked, this was an equal opportunity illness. <laughs> Did not matter. Daily, culti daily cultivate love that looks for nothing in return and meditate on. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Fear. A few slugs of this emotional mind blower sends one off into a fit of destructive energy that can wreck home, family, self, and affairs before sanity is restored. Spiritual progress is temporarily paralyzed, and all kinds of thought demons move in with this binge. Remedy. Faith. As the capacity for fear is drained away, faith can fill its place until there is no more room for fear. Fear can drown out faith and faith can blot out fear, but the two cannot reside, reside together. A choice must be made. We realize peace of mind does not depend on conditions outside us, but for those inside us. Depression. This is one of my big ones. Gosh, I'm going to have to hurry on. We're kind of, we're kind of running out of time here. Definitely emotional intoxicant, that is a downer. Dangerous to serenity. One gulp plunges one into an abyss of remorse, regret, and rejection. It floats around in eternal hell, unable to touch base with any solid ground or balance. Emotional vision is blurred. Cannot see the helping outstretched hand. Emotional hearing is dulled. Cannot hear words of encouragement and strength. Emotional touch is deadened, cannot feel love, emotional taste is bland, cannot go past taste of isolation and melancholy. 
emotional smell is weakened, cannot perceive incense, in, incense of harmony and fellowship. The whole being is drugged by depression. That realistic contact with self and others is, is suspended. I so know this. I call it a black hole where nothing can penetrate. Remedy. Huge daily doses of attitude of gratitude. Willingness to surrender this unique pain. Sobriety follows quickly when one can be grateful for pain rather than struggle with it. Thanking God for pain releases it back into his care. We are saying that we realize we are not perfect enough to manage all our affairs. That we recognize only that his principles provide us with protection and guidance. Guidance. Gratitude brings release, release brings experience, experience brings hope, hope brings faith, faith brings freedom from fear. Could be that a spiritual awakening takes place, a rebirth occurs, and one is never the same again. Blame. This is a big one in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. A keen, smooth, emotional beverage with blame, all inhibitions and self-defects are freed and vented on all those faltering, imperfect creatures out there. A few swigs of blame allows one to go to the core of his own magnificent nature and expose the blundering of those who are stumbling blocks in his path to well-earned, overdue, and deserved glory. As long as a person can hold his blame, he feels no need to sober up and take a look at himself. When the intoxicant from blame begins to wear off, one can keep the buzz going by mixing his drinks, usually shots of criticism, intolerance, resentment, and dishonesty. He will then alter being, alternate between being ecstatically happy and falling down crying drunk. When he survives the hangover, he only remembers the sweet wallop his cu cuckoo loco gave him, and he can hardly wait for the next big binge. And that's what I had to learn. As long as my eyes were on others, and long as I was blaming others for, for what was wrong with me, I never, ever had to take responsibility for me. Remedy. Daily intake of inventory vitamins. With the emotional tone and considerably improved from the inventory vitamins, the need to put oneself at the mercy of any wind that blows on one's world is removed. It is replaced with total abstinence from blame. Total abstinence brings miracle of tolerance, grace, rich spiritual re rewards reflected in a life of real fulfillment. Much that happens to me, good or bad, is self-created. A new beginning is provided every day, and the 24 hours can be started over any time the need arises, and that is good medicine to take. Emotional sobriety enables us to carry heavy emotional burdens without breaking down under them. The more facilitating the environment to provide compensation, the less need we feel for self-protection. The more endangering the environment to our feelings of well-being, of well-being the greater the need for self-protection. Trying to make a good decision as to which, which was which made many of us impose self-limitations which became tremendous obstacles to emotional growth. The protective fences became walls of isolation, cutting off experience with people and things. Most of us were convinced we had not succeeded in winning at the excessive competitiveness found in the affairs of our lives, or if we felt we had succeeded, then we were really confused at why we could not beat alcohol. Either way, we could not get comfortable in, this, in our emotional area. AA and Al-Anon offered a way out of this dilemma. One giving to emotional slips has no way of knowing when the compulsion may assert itself. Emotional sobriety is not a sometime thing. We can recognize that emotional binges are often involuntary, but always forgivable. We begin to recover from emotional vulnerability when we understand and accept emotions instead of fighting them, when we find constructive ways to express feelings, when we keep a sense of humor, if you don't have one, get one. Emotional sobriety comes when we accentuate positive emotions, record feelings in a journal so that you can see where you have come. And finally, to paraphrase the beautiful golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
This workshop, my AA sponsor sent me, and this was done by a lady in Odessa, Texas in 1976. So this is not a new thing. So when we hear all the books and the self-help stuff that we're all familiar with, this was going on a long time before all that was happening. Okay. Now. My friend Jan Fashow does a thing called The Magic is in the Writing. And uh, have you ever wanted God to speak to you, personally speak to you? Well, I'm going to give you a tool in which God can personally speak to you. First, find a quiet place. And I'm going to give you some instructions, and then we're going to, I'm going to put on some music, and then we're going to read for a few minutes, and then we're going to write for a few minutes. You find a quiet place. You take pen and paper. And the first thing you do is just write out how you feel about a situation, whatever it is. What you want is your ex you want some answers. So the first thing you do is if there's something really, whatever's going on in your life, whatever it is, really bad, really good, whatever, just write out how you feel about it. With your pen in hand, listen and wait, anticipating a response. Other words, you know that the answer is going to come to you. Take down in writing whatever thoughts come to you. Whatever it is, take it down in writing. Reread the entire text. And then follow the instructions. A, if directly guided what to do, begin. <clears throat> if you feel like you've got an answer, then begin to do what the answer, what the writing says. If you didn't get an answer, then just do it again. Just write again. In other words, the answer hasn't come. Please thank God for the answers. And if no guidance comes, then just wait and do it again. Okay. Write down the problem. Ask for the problem. Then anticipate an answer as you begin to write. And then read your answer. And this sounds really crazy, but I tell you, it works. Now, I'm going to put on some music. And I thank you so much for this weekend. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to let me be here and to share with you the things that have been so important to me because I never ever believed that I could be the woman that I am today because I came here a victim unable to take care of myself or think for myself but because of you I am today the woman I always wanted to be and I know that these things work so and thank you for letting me share my experience strength and hope